take a photo first. Uh, I'll we'll get there eventually. There we go. All right. Hey, everyone. I hope you're enjoying your Laracon experience. Uh, my name is Mitchell Davis, as Michael mentioned, and I run an agency called Atlas Software in Sydney. Um, I'm here to convince you today that mobile apps don't suck anymore. Um, now, you might be thinking, why pitch building mobile apps to a bunch of Laravel developers, right? It's, it's not really in our wheelhouse. For most of us, not yet it isn't, but it could be using the skills you have right now, and I hope that after this talk, you'll be convinced to give it a try, all right? So, I've been working with Laravel for nine years now, building business applications, SASs, reporting dashboards, sending emails, dealing with queues and Forge and all of that, um, all the usual stuff, probably just like you. We write uh, web apps in Vue and Inertia and sometimes Livewire, probably just like you. As for app development, I got my start at uni a decade ago now. It didn't go very well. Uh, we tried building a mobile app using PhoneGap, which maybe some of you remember, yes. <laughs> uh, we're not punching down here. Um, but uh, the idea is you basically, you bundle your website into an app file, you stick it on the app store. Uh, it didn't run very well. Uh, we never finished the project, and I came away from it thinking, man, mobile apps suck. And that's just something I'm not interested in. Well. That all changed four years ago. For the last four years, our agency has also been building mobile apps for our clients. When a client came to us and said they wanted a mobile app to complement the existing web platform that we built for them, I recalled those days of using PhoneGap, and I was really hesitant to take on the project. I thought maybe this wasn't for us. Um, but we persevered. We did a ton of research into what was then available, because it has changed a lot, and we were able to deliver a mobile app for them. It actually ended up being a lot of fun. So I've learned a lot over these last four years, and I want to share it with you today to encourage you to embrace the touchscreen. So I'd like to encourage you to get involved. This talk has a bunch of demos in it towards the end, uh, and I'd love for you to have a go at them. They're all available in the Laracon app. So if you haven't installed it yet, uh, I'd love if you would use the link on the screen there, go grab it, and log in. Um, you'll need your ticket code, which was in the email that Michael sent out a few days ago. Just scroll down a little in the email. So while you get set up and do that, I'll just take one minute to talk about my journey to the stage today. So my speaking today has been a few years in the making. I was in the crowd in 2019 and again last year, and as you can see, I've made a few changes. <laughs> I'm a lot more interested in hats now. <laughs> um, I also want to thank two people. Uh, so last year, Michael Dorinda reached out and said he hoped I would submit a talk again this year as I missed out by apparently one slot last year. Um, that gave me the confidence boost I needed to ultimately get up on this stage. And all these last few months, uh, Michael has been really encouraging and supportive, and he's just running an awesome conference, right? So I'm really thankful for Michael. I would also like to thank my wonderful fiance, Nicole, who is here somewhere and hasn't told me where she is so I don't get psyched out. Um, and our boys, uh, that's Franklin and Remington there. Um, Nicole's been super supportive the entire time I've worked on the app, and believe me, I have worked on it a lot. This has been crazy, um, so I certainly don't take that for granted. So that's enough of the personal stuff. Uh, I hope you've all downloaded the app, uh, so let's get into it. Why should you build a mobile app? Reason number one, mobile apps are dope, right? You get a binary. How often are we, as web developers, getting to build a binary? Like, it just doesn't happen. Something pretty cool, I think. A mobile app makes your product legit. In the minds of your customers, a mobile app is a step above some other web-based software that they might be using. It's a big selling point for the typical non-developer. Additionally, you get the ability to send your customers push notifications and your front of mind every time they swipe past your app on their home screen. Your users deserve a great mobile experience, and not only that, they demand a great mobile experience. 
if your users can't use your product on their phones, unless you're in some pretty specific industries, they might not stick around too long. And sure, we can and we do make mobile websites, but again, in the mind of the non-developer, a mobile app is often much better and more natural feeling than a mobile website. So, how do apps work? I can see your faces now. <laughs> that depends on who you ask. Um, if you want to build an app, you've got a few options. You can build a native app, going the whole hog. So, if you go this route, you'll learn Java and Swift, Gradle, Xcode, Android Studio, Objective-C. You won't get any code reuse, but your app will be as performant as possible. For a web developer, this sucks. Next thing you could do is build a web app, quote unquote. And this is like that phone gap example I gave earlier where you're actually running HTML, CSS, and JavaScript inside of a web browser that's kind of bundled into an app. They're not very performant, uh, and you are really limited with the device APIs that you can call because it is running inside of a, a browser. So for a web developer, this is better as it leverages our existing skills, but it still sucks. In first place, the gold medal, you could build a React Native app. Now, these apps are written in JavaScript, uh, specifically with React and in JSX, which, for those that don't know, it's JavaScript that kind of looks like HTML. It's a bit different, but you'll see. The, the JSX gets compiled into actual native UI components that run on each platform, iOS and Android. And this makes your app very performant, since it's literally running native code. Um, through different tooling, you can style your app with Tailwind classes, uh, and it'll run on both platforms out of the box. So you don't have to learn any new languages for a web developer. Finally, this doesn't suck anymore. So how do React Native apps work? Let's take a look. So I think I'm this one. Cool. So. What I have here is a React Native code base. Uh, I created this running NPX Create Expo app, and we will get into Expo in a minute. Um, I've then run an iPhone simulator on the right here. Um, and this is bundled into Xcode on any Mac device. For Windows folks or, or on Linux, you can run a simulator using Android Studio. Um, if we take a look around, you can see we have an app directory, and this just has a few files in it. These are our screens. So the, file, uh, the screen that we're looking at on the right is this index.tsx. Uh, it is in TypeScript, but uh, you can also just write uh, normal JavaScript, so don't be scared of that. So what we have is a live reload. So if I just write, this is a test, and I hit save, bam. That will appear on the screen. And this is how you develop your apps. You're just, it's just like having a website on your other screen there, and you're writing in your editor, and it's updating live. Works exactly the same way. Um, we can make uh, plenty of changes, as you would imagine. So if I try, there we go, thank you. If I go, OK, let's make the background green. Maybe it's not the best design, but <laughs> you can see how quickly you can put things together. All right, um, let's also do a, uh, let's change the header up the top there. So um, what we can do, oh, stack, and they weren't joking that like, you forget how to type when you're on stage. Uh, <laughs> that is real. So uh, I can change the title here to be home, let's say. So. That's going to update live. Um, and then there's plenty of other options. You can Obviously, you can change how everything looks um, all over here. Next thing that we're going to do is just add another screen, and then I'll show you how to link to that. Um, so if I just copy this and then, oop, and then paste it, and we will call this about, uh, I will call this one about, and uh, let's say this is oop, this is the about screen. Man, they are not kidding. Um, okay, so uh, what I can then do to actually link to that screen, uh, there's a link component. So if I go link, that will pull that in from something called Expo Router, and then you can see already my IDE knows that oh, this is another route inside of the app. 
So I can just go about. Cool. So I know this isn't styled. We'll get into that later. Um, but you get the fundamentals, right? So now if I click on about, great. It takes me to this page. The title is called about. It's got its content. And then you see this nice, like, native-looking uh, navigation menu at the top. Like, all of that is just baked in. You, you saw everything I just did there to get that to work. Cool. One final thing that I want to point out in this code is that you can see we're using these text and view uh, components from React Native. These are the ones that actually compile down um, into the native uh, UI components for each platform that make it run really performantly. So we're not using divs and p tags and buttons like we would in HTML. Uh, these are actual components that will then render down into native, um, making it nice and fast. One final point of difference from HTML to uh, React Native is that um, views, which again are kind of like divs, uh, everything is flexbox by default. Um, and it actually is flex column instead of flex row uh, by, by default. So, and that kind of makes sense when you think most phones are probably in portrait mode or, or tablets, things like that. Cool. All right. So that is our demo. So how does that native part work that I talked about with the components there? Um, React Native apps have two layers. They have native and they have JavaScript. Now, the native layer is all the Swift, Java, binary type of stuff. That's where it lives. We almost never need to go there. You hardly need to think about it. Um, then there's the JavaScript layer, and that's where we live and we get to play. So you'll write code that calls the native layer, and that makes things nice and performant. Um, and then the, uh, all of your screens, all of the elements on the page, everything like that, you control that inside of this JavaScript layer. So to mix these layers together and have them be able to talk to each other, you just install NPM packages, so very similar to what we have to do as web developers. Uh, the packages that you install include any native code that's needed to run them on each platform, and the bundler knows how to put it all together at the end to compile one binary, which is your app. So where do you find these packages? How do you know what's good? You can go searching GitHub looking for packages, mixing and matching, or you can use Expo, which I like to think of as the Laravel of the React Native world. So, Expo is a framework that runs on top of React Native, much like how Laravel runs on top of PHP, and it smooths out some of the rough edges for us. Expo has packages for everything you see here. So there's camera, there's deep linking into your app and into other apps. Uh, we can interact with Face ID, fingerprint and pin, get the user's location, send them notifications, watch videos, you can do all of these things, and I'm not kidding, 81 more packages that they have in their SDK. <laughs> I don't know how they manage it. Uh, in addition to a bunch of packages, Expo gives you an ecosystem of tools that all work together to make your development life easier. One of the coolest features, I think, uh, that Expo provides is called Expo Go. And this is a sandbox app. It's available on physical devices, so you can install it right now, if you wanted, from the app and Play Store. You can also run it in simulators if you end up going down this route and want to build your own apps. Um, so what it does, inside of Expo Go, it has all of those Expo packages I just talked about, all 100 odd of them, um, including the native code. So this lets you get started writing an app instantly because you don't have to think about that native layer. They've already done it for you. So if you want to use anything that's in Expo, you can write it in Expo. Um, you can run it, rather, in Xpoker. You've actually, excuse me, you've already seen it. That's what the last demo was in. Um, one really important note is this allows Windows developers and Linux developers to develop for iOS apps, which uh, otherwise would not be possible because you, to build for uh, iOS, you need Xcode, which is only available on a Mac. So this saves you from having to go buy a Mac if you want to uh, build apps. The next thing to talk about are development builds. So um, you can think of these as a more customized and flexible approach uh, to building your application with just the dependencies that you need. 
So with Expo Go, you get a lot of pre-built modules, all 100 odd of them, and that's great for general use. But what if you need a setup that's unique to just your app's requirements? Development builds let you generate a special app binary tailored to only the native packages that you need. So if you're using specific uh, features like camera, or push notifications, or Bluetooth, you can create a build, a development build, that's optimized and includes only those dependencies. Uh, it is a sandbox environment, so it's perfect for testing all of your custom functionality without the overhead of unnecessary modules. Development builds also make debugging more accurate since you're working with a binary that very closely mimics your final production app. So this helps uh, catch issues that might be specific to your app's native layer. Um, they can also include debug information as well. So uh, by running a development build, you get a lot more info about what's going on on uh, the device while you're working on building out the app, which as you can imagine is, is pretty handy. Um, and these are compiled using Android Studio and Xcode. Now, that's not for everyone, so... Um, <laughs> hang on, I've misspoken. Um, we'll move on. What do we do about Windows or Linux, uh, where we can't build for iOS devices due to the dependency on Xcode that I mentioned? The final piece of this whole thing that I want to talk about is EAS Build. And EAS stands for Expo Application Services. This is a cloud platform. Again, some parallels to Laravel. Um, now with EAS Build, you can run cloud builds of your application. It's a total game changer, uh, especially for non-Mac developers. Uh, so this will allow you to uh, test and build and run iOS applications. You have no more need for a Mac. Um, you also don't have the hassle of setting up a complicated local environment. So all the heavy lifting happens on Expo servers. You don't have to think about Xcode or macOS at all. They've taken care of it for you. The service isn't just limited to iOS builds though, mind you. It works, of course, for both iOS and Android. And it makes building and distributing your apps much more efficient. You write your code, configure your build settings, and you hit build, and EAS does the rest. EAS Build can handle CI/CD pipelines as well, which I would strongly encourage. So they have integrations for GitHub Actions. This makes it easier to automate your builds and your deployments. So you focus on the development, EAS will ensure that your app is ready to ship. So finally, when your build is ready, you can download the binary, you can test it, and you can even deploy it to testers or onto the app stores without having to leave your development workflow. There's a an awesome CLI app that they have. Okay, the next point is uh, EAS submit. So when you have a built binary, you need to push that up into the App Store and the Play Store. What we have found to be the best way to do this is EAS submit. They can automate that submission of the build that you've done in EAS build uh, straight up to the App and Play Store. You don't have to download it and then upload it manually. You don't have to open Xcode for anyone that's had to deal with any of that stuff. And this is completely free. The final piece of the puzzle is EAS update. And I'll actually demo this for you um, in a moment. So this allows you to make changes to the JavaScript layer that we talked about without needing to go through app review. You don't have to send JavaScript updates to Apple and Google to review them. So you can distribute over-the-air updates to your users as long as the build that's running on their device uh, is compatible. It has to be a compatible build with that native layer that we talked about. And this is free on EAS for up to 1,000 monthly active users, which is quite a lot of people. Um, and then it's, like, it's fairly affordable after that. So I'm going to give you a walkthrough of how to, sorry, uh, how to publish an app. First thing you gotta do is write the app. I mean, that's pretty <laughs> self-explanatory. <laughs> Hopefully you, you got it. Um, and you know, you have to learn quite a bit about how React Native and things like that work, but it is totally within your skill set to be able to do this, I, I can assure you. After you've written the app, you'll build it, and then you wanna test it on real phones. Um, and I can tell you, uh, for, for Laricon, this was very useful. Um, I had some lovely help from some of the speakers, uh, and, and they really helped me get the uh, Laricon app up and running before we then shipped it to everyone here. To test your app, 
After you've submitted a build to the App and Play Store, it will go into a testing track just by default. So these tracks are called test flight for iOS and uh, internal testing for Android. Now you can share these builds with your team. Uh, so they're meant for, you know, not your customers necessarily, but you could choose to share it with them if you need it. So you've got your team, your QA people, your trusted customers. There's a limit for each system, each uh, App Store, Play Store, for 100 users for internal testing. And this is what we use to test the mobile app. Um, a limit of 10,000 users for external testing. So if your, you know, your system is awesome and you have a lot of users, you can add up to 10,000 people that will have access to early builds before you then publish them. So that's kind of cool. And users can share feedback instantly with screenshots and notes. It's all just like integrated straight in. So they take a screenshot on their phone and then they get the option, would you like to share this with the developers? So it's actually a really neat workflow. Now we'll talk about going live. So you prepare a release by promoting your build to the production track. Uh, this will trigger a manual review by Apple and Google reviewers. They check that your app is compliant with their guidelines. Now, this can take 30 minutes, or it can take over a week, which is what happened with our app. Uh, <laughs> you can imagine how stressful that was. Um, uh, if, you, uh, if your app is rejected, you need to fix whatever the issues are and they will tell you. Um, it's actually like pretty handy. We, actually, we had a, a problem with the Laracon app where um, when we were asking permission for the camera, uh, if you wanted to enroll in the game, they didn't like the fact that the button said grant permission. Um, instead, it had to say continue. So that, they flat out rejected a build for that. So you've got to follow the guidelines, uh, which are there for a good reason, but you'll be right. If approved, you can choose to publish your release to the store manually, uh, or you can do it automatically as soon as it's approved, which is exactly what we did. So let's talk a little bit more about the Laracon app. Um, so what I can do, nope, not that one, okay, over here. So I learned when I was walking onto the stage that unfortunately my phone got unplugged. So we just need to take a moment, and you're gonna see how the sausage is made here. Let's do one thing first. All right, there's a lot going on in my last eight minutes, so bear with me. What I have here is a pull request to the Laracon app, which is on hopefully all of your phones now, right? So um, I'm going to uh, merge this in in just a second, and it's going to do an EAS update. And you can see all I've done is just changed on the menu tab. Um, we've got our uh, information there. It says, we love building great software, and I've just changed that to an emoji. So um, this is not, you know, nothing crazy, but um, if I merge that in, and then I go over to actions, boom. I'm being quick so you don't see too much. Uh, so hopefully this will run, like this is live. So if something goes wrong, whatever. Um, we're just gonna roll with it, <laughs> all right? But let's see, fingers crossed. Um, cool, so that's, that's step one, and now I need to get QuickTime up and running. That is gonna take three minutes. Uh, okay, I need to kill QuickTime. I promise this wasn't my fault, all right? I've, I've tried. Um, so I go here, hello, screen. I promise this will be cool. You'll get to see my phone when it works. Okay, all right. Um, so then I need to set this up. If you didn't know about the left and right things in full screen, it's pretty cool. All right, so we're up. So I have the, uh, the source code for the Laracon app, which is running, hopefully, on all of your phones, and I want to show you that this is live. So this is me moving around on the phone here. Um, so this is our home screen. And I can kind of show you a few little things. What we're doing, like when you're building mobile apps, you have to think about network requests and stuff like that. Some of you might have noticed that the app doesn't work offline at all because it was in the too hard basket, all right? So I'm sorry. So <laughs> you could do that for your apps, all right? <laughs> um, so uh, we had like a countdown. Maybe you saw it in, like in the lead up to the, the app. You can see there's some TypeScript stuff here with like the red squiggles. It's all good, you know, it still works. 
It's fine. Uh, just let's just chill. You know, it's okay. Um, so, <laughs> so um, I'll show you where in the app that little like the menu thing that we had down the bottom was, um, which is here, and then we will get into some. Demos. So this was it here, and you can kind of see like the text on the left here uh, matches the text on the right that you can see, right? So like <laughs> job done. Um, cool. So let's get into the demos. So this is the part that you can interact with. So I want you to go into this talk uh, on the schedule. Let me move a few things. So I will do that now, uh, and we're going to go to location. So. Um, let me show you the code on the screen, but you can also see it yourself if you click on the React tab. You'll get to see the actual code which is running on your phone right now. You can see it on your phone. Uh, I thought that was pretty cool. So um, we don't want camera, we want location. So this is how this works. So. I've already granted permission. It's my own app. So uh, I go use last known position, and this loads instantly. You can see that it knows already where I am. That's great. Um, and then we're drawing that out onto the screen here using a package called Map View. I think it is. It's like very popular somewhere in here. React Native Maps. There you go. It is a Map View. If I hit Get Current Position, this is a lot slower. Um, can sometimes take about 10 seconds. So if you're doing anything with location, you might want to think about um, using the last known position as kind of a, hey, they're probably roughly in this area, and then you can kind of hone it in. Um, so that's something to, to consider. Reviews, do me a favor. Hit this button. Review this app. I would love five stars only, please. Uh, <laughs> now, if I hit it, it doesn't do anything because I've already reviewed my own app. Um, but hopefully, for you guys, it will come up. Five stars, please. Um, and again, the code for that is, is in there. I am rushing because I've got a cool ender. Um, deep links. Let's do this. So. Deep links are really cool. They kind of work the same as uh, they do on, you know, on our computers and stuff. Like HTTPS is okay. It's going to be a web page and SFTP and all of those types of things. Mail to, etc. Works exactly the same. Your phone does all of that um, under the hood. You can also use this to uh, open up other apps if they are installed on the user's device. So, if I go to Maps, for example, here. It can. It can open maps, and it does. So there you go. You've just got directions to bowling tonight. Um, we can open email. This one's kind of cool. I don't know why this is a thing, but shoebox is like the prefix for Apple's wallet. <laughs> I didn't ask. I'm <laughs> like, whatever. That's cool. Uh, I'll show you my photo library. So this, just a quick behind the scenes. Look at all these photos. And this was me testing the crap out of this app, the facial recognition and stuff, which if any of you are like a bit weirded out about it, you can see me. I'm genuine. I'm not doing anything weird with it, and we're deleting it all after the conference is done. So um, get involved in the game. Win some points. You might win a prize. All right? Um, cool. Then biometric authentication. So this is like to trigger face ID. So if I do that, ah, I have actually um, I've blocked that. Uh, somehow. Um, anyway, but for you, it might be Face ID uh, if you've given it access and your phone has it. Uh, storage, this is key value storage, uh, which you can run inside of your app. Um, and you can see if I go add an item, I can then read that out anywhere else inside of the app. Notifications, so this one, uh, you can send yourself a notification. Now, because I'm in do not disturb mode, it will be sitting up here. So, um, but for you, hopefully it pops up on your screen. This is what your phone, oh, where did that go? Oh, no. There we go. Um, this is what your phone actually receives when you get a notification. So I thought this might be kind of cool. Maybe you want to suss it out. Um, and then you can trigger local um, notifications and delay them by like a week or a month, or you know, you can set them as recurring to say, hey, every Monday send this person a, a notification. You can also do, I might run a little long. How did our, our update go? Uh, <laughs> look at that, it's down there, it worked. <laughs> so uh, if I go, there's a new update available, tap to fetch it, it's gonna download it, 
Hopefully it'll all come through for you guys and then there's that notification and then boom, there it is. We have the emoji. <laughs> all right. I've got two more things for you in less than a minute to do it, but we're going to try. Uh, so I'm going to run this uh, vapor command and hopefully that will send everyone a notification. It might not work. I haven't fully tested it. Look, it doesn't look like it's worked, but that's okay. Um, anyway, hopefully this one will. So I want you to go to the, I have a slide. Look, just, just work with me here. Um, before we do this last part, I run an agency, as I said, it's called Atlas Software. You can visit it at atlas.dev. Uh, if you're interested in having a mobile app built, uh, hopefully you like what we're doing. Um, we're gonna do one last demo here. So I want you to go to the, I know that's a black screen, don't worry. Go to the camera, and what I want you to do is take a photo of me. And hopefully, it will come up on the screen behind me. And I wanted to, I wanted to do like a, ladies and gentlemen, the Jericho, you know, type of a thing from Iron Man. <laughs> so hopefully, hey, all right. So I know you can't zoom in on the app, I'm sorry, but uh, it was in the too hard basket. So hopefully that'll all come through. I was hoping for a few more. It might be a little slow, but uh, gee, that's it. we got the Jericho. All right, that's cool. So, thank you very much. I hope you've enjoyed this talk, and I hope you'll consider giving app development a go. We made it work. Come here, we did it. We did it. <laughs> thank you, mate. We did it. We did it. Uh, he was not kidding. Like we wanted to send those ticket emails on Monday, and we thought for sure it would be Apple that would hold us up. But Apple was like 30 minutes, and and Google were like emailing them. We're like, please. I literally please. begged uh, Google. I wrote them a support email. Like I am begging you. This is going to be so embarrassing if this doesn't go through. So, and then they approved it an hour later. So <laughs> it worked. So the, the the key is to beg. To beg Google. Yeah. <laughs> um. There's a few questions here that we'll just quickly go through. Um, what issues did we have? Like the main issues that we had was the submission process, like the building. The was submission, difficult. yes, um, but also the. Oh, I want to leave this up, but the the name tags in the photos when you go view a photo, that was like a nightmare. Uh, really, like a lot of ChatGPT. How do I fix this math? Like it was rough, and then um, swiping between photos in the gallery. You might want it to be like a bit better. It, it like, it's like a black screen, and then it loads the next image. I couldn't get that to work either. So, look, yeah. you get what you get. All right. Yeah. <laughs> um, how long did it take? All this up? was about two months, two months of like a lot of time. A, um, a lot. But I didn't really get a chance to talk about it. But I built like a whole conference event app management platform behind this because I didn't have enough else to do. So, <laughs> so that took a lot of the time. Um, you can get an app up and running in like a week. Uh, so I, I would encourage you to give it a go. Nice. And um, la last question. This, this is the top voted question. It's from a M Mitchell. <laughs> How did you make this app so good? A lot of hard work. <laughs> but we got there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. We've, we've been waiting. Should we tell them? What the, Let's tell them. The prize is? You tell them. I'll tell them? Yeah, you've got a good voice. Do, do, we, know, do we know about the, the other thing, the lightning rounds? Do we need to talk uh, about that? I don't know. So, okay. Quickly. We sent it out. The notification didn't work before. So, look. There was a lightning round. All right, let's, let me tell you the story. So there was a lightning round during lunch and during each of the breaks, there's meant to be a lightning round where um, attendees, some of you, 10% of you, uh, randomly selected each break will be worth six times points, so mm. 30 points. But then randomly, 1% of the audience will be worth negative 30 points. Mm. Now, there was meant to be a notification that was sent out during the break, um, and Chris, who works with me at Atlas, uh, sent it out, and it didn't work. Uh, so that's all on me, but I think I've got it fixed. Regardless, I will get it fixed for tonight because we're running this at like each break. So um, yeah, look out for that. You might be called a chosen one, which is nice, or you might be called a bad apple. 
Um, we were kind of like, yeah, goofing around. Um, so yeah. watch out. Great. Uh, the, do you want to know what the prize is? Should we tell me now what the prize is? Yeah. yeah. Man, they're not that keen. Do you no, want to tell them? No. Do you care? I don't know. Have you, like, yeah, that's better. That's better. Have you, have you been to Alaricon? We don't like mess around with prizes. So the prize this year is a 15-inch MacBook Air that is with 16 gig. It's 512 gig of um, hard drive. And like Apple annoyingly like released the new like base model with 16 gig the day after we bought it. So that is the prize. We're giving it away tomorrow. Taylor's going to hand it to the winner. So. Um, install the app, take photos, capture memories. Thank you very much, Mitchell. Woo! Thank you.